the right time to launch a feature or launch a product is right before it seems possible. If Google, with its infinite resources, with the largest email user base in the world, if they're not willing to invest and try to figure out what the future's email is, maybe I need to do something about this. We realize that, holy crap, for the entire history of email clients, the data in that email has been completely inaccessible. You can do like basic searches and stuff, but if you want to like ask a question and have the email client figure out the answer for you, there was really no way to do that. But suddenly this like giant corpus of unstructured text that everyone has like gigabytes and gigabytes is suddenly has gone from like this pile that's eating up disk space to like maybe something that's really valuable to you. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, my guest is Andrew Lee, founder of Shortwave, an AI-powered email app that describes itself as the smartest email app on planet Earth. Like many of us, I've been using Gmail for roughly 20 years now. And while I've tried several alternative email clients over time, for me, none have really stuck. Shortwave, however, has truly impressed me. And I've continued to use it past the point of curiosity and into the realm of forming a genuinely new and likely lasting habit. My favorite feature by far is the AI Assistant which presents in the increasingly familiar form factor of the natural language sidebar chatbot. It can help you search through and configure your inbox, check your availability and schedule meetings, and refer to similar emails you've sent in the past so that it can imitate your style when drafting responses for you. As someone who's long since given up on Inbox Zero and really just wants an AI assistant to help me navigate my overloaded inbox, I can definitely say that I've had a few magical experiences with this product. The time saved in searching for things that I know exist but can't quite remember the keywords for, unto itself, has been delightful. Andrew, who previously founded Firebase and has already been acquired by Google once, was extremely open about the technology underlying Shortwave, reflecting the fact that this is no thin wrapper startup. And I had a ton of fun getting so deep into the details. We covered Shortwave's rag stack, which is powered by a full download and re-indexing of your entire inbox, a process that takes hours and costs shortwave real money, but which creates a remarkably responsive experience downstream. We also got into how the AI assistant works from user message input to AI response, including tool selection, query reformulation, feature extraction, retrieval, re-ranking, and finally, answer generation. We also got into which models shortwave is using, which include Mistral, fine-tuned GPT 3.5 turbos, and GPT 4 turbo, a list which is always subject to change, and right now, perhaps even more so than usual, since Claude 3 was just launched after we recorded, and Long Context Gemini 1.5 is on the horizon as well. Toward the end, we discussed how Andrew thinks about building and timing product launches in such a fast-moving space, his vision for the future of shortwave, how he expects email to evolve, and how we'll all manage the inevitable rise of high-quality AI-generated spam, as well as how companies will use a deep AI integration to manage knowledge on a team-wide basis. If you're building with large language models, this conversation has a ton of great nuggets which you won't want to miss. And if you're just an average email user, as I'm pretty sure all of you are, I definitely recommend checking out Shortwave. To be clear, this is not a paid promotion. Andrew was kind enough to give me a free year of Shortwave, but that's it. I'm genuinely just super enthusiastic about this product. And you do have my commitment that I will always be transparent about any sponsorship deals that we might do in the future. Of course, your feedback is always welcome. You can leave me a message on our new website at cognitiverevolution.ai, that's cognitiverevolution.ai, or DM me on the social media platform of your choice. Now, let's dive deep into AI technology powering the future of email with Andrew Lee of Shortwave. Andrew Lee founder of Shortwave. Welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. Thank you for having me here, Nathan. Really excited. I am very excited about this one. So I have been using your product, Shortwave, which is a, an email app over the last couple of weeks getting ready for this episode. And it is one that has really 
kind of got me excited for multiple reasons. So I'll just give you a little gushing praise right out of the gate. And then I really want to get into all the weeds of how it works. Like many people, I've been using Gmail for a long time. I hazard, uh, hesitate to kind of count up all the years at this point, but it's getting on toward 20. And a lot of alternative interfaces have come out, a lot of you know ways to get to inbox zero. And honestly, none of those have really ever stuck with me, though I have tried a number over time. Shortwave has really stood out to me for a couple of things. One, the email search is awesome. And for that alone, I think it's you know pretty exciting. And then second, the AI assistant, which is actually how I'm using search, which we can unpack in more detail. But the AI assistant is perhaps the best writing as me experience that I have encountered in any app that I've used so far. So it has actually been, you know, while I kind of sign up for everything and, you know, we'll put some some time into trying all the products, you know, that we talk about on the podcast. This is one that I have found myself very naturally kind of excitedly going back to. And, you know, the muscle memory of going straight to Gmail is, is certainly pretty deeply entrenched. So that is no small accomplishment. I think it's reflective of some really great work under the hood. Great job by you and the team. And with that, I'm excited to unpack in lots more detail how it all works. That is awesome to hear. Thank you so much. Maybe for starters, just to take one quick step back, like many application developers that we talk to, you started this company before large language models were a thing in the way that they are today. Well, you want to give us just a little bit of context for what it was that kind of inspired you to start the company, how big of a part of your plan AI was at the time, and kind of how the technology trajectory that we're on has perhaps, you know, either been what you expected or perhaps surprised you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, AI was not really on the radar at all for us when we first started the company. The actual motivation for it really was a couple of things that happened in 2019. So for some background, I, I was unemployed at the time. I had previously sold a company, a Firebase to Google and worked there for a while. I'd taken some time off and I was kind of doing my own thing. And I got to the point where I was a little restless. I wanted to start something new. And I saw, I saw a couple of things happen. So the first thing that happened was the democracy protest in Hong Kong. I don't know if you remember thing that stood out to me was the way the Chinese government was using WeChat as a means of control of those protesters, where if you said something they didn't like, you know, maybe somebody would show up at your house or maybe they wouldn't get the message. And I looked at that and I said, hey, that's a bad thing. Uh, but at least that's not happening in the other parts of the world, right? Uh, everywhere else, you know, the, those centralized communication providers, are, they're, you know, they're trustworthy, they're doing a good job. And then I started to realize that actually, maybe that's not uh, happening the way I was hoping in other parts of the world too, including potentially in the US and in Europe and places like that. And then I said to myself, well, at least we have email, right? Even if I don't necessarily want to do all my communication on, you know, WhatsApp or something like that, I can call back email. And then Google killed off Google Inbox, which to me was, you know, their next gen email product. And I thought to myself, hey, if Google with its infinite resources with the largest email user base in the world, if they're not willing to invest and try to figure out what the future's email is, you know, maybe I need to do something about this. And I have a long history with email. Actually, my dad and I ran an ISP in our basement in the 90s. And, you know, I, I, I have a lot of experience running email servers. And I, you know, I have a, a love for the federated protocol that underpins email and all the things that that enables. And I said, okay, you know what? Maybe I got to do something. So I call up a bunch of my Firebase buddies and I said, hey, you guys want to start another company? I'm thinking we should build an email app. And surprise, surprise, they were, they were excited about it too. And so... We kicked it off at the beginning of 2020, initially really focused on making something that did justice to this amazing underlying email protocol. And the first thing we tried to do was collaboration because Firebase was a product really designed to help people build collaborative apps. We knew a lot about what people liked in collaboration. We knew a lot about how to build those types of systems and we thought email was, was right for that. So we built an email client designed to help you collaborate and fairly quickly discovered that that was kind of hopeless as a V1 product for go-to-market reasons. Like you couldn't, you couldn't sell to anyone because the people who were looking for email clients were not simultaneously looking to get off of Slack. And the people who were looking for Slack were not simultaneously wanting to pitch their entire team on not using their existing email client and switching to a new email client. And so we could never get someone who was like looking for both things at the same time. And so at that point we pivoted and we said, Hey, 
we are getting some traction on just the pure like individual email experience. Let's double down there. Let's really make a just a really bang up individual business email client. And so we spent the next year and a half or so working on that, which is a big project. If you ever tried to build an email client, there's still a lot of stuff in there. Just lots of little features and just the basics of like displaying your email correctly and threading your email correctly, making search work is quite hard. But we got there like about a year and a half ago, we got to the point where like we had a solid email client. It did all the things you expected. It worked on the pl platforms you needed to work on. You know, it had the core features that you'd expect it to have. And we started looking around and realizing, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on here with these large language models. And, you know, we've been following it for a while, but every time we'd played with them previously, they didn't quite seem production ready. And this time they did. This time, you know, we, we tried some stuff. Actually, one of my old co-founder came in and like demoed some stuff. And we decided, actually, we feel like the time is right. This is actually something that we can, we can build a real product on. And the thing that was so exciting for us is we realized that, holy crap, for, for the entire history of email clients, the data in that email has been completely inaccessible, inaccessible really to the computer. You can do like basic searches and stuff, but if you want to like ask a question and have the email client figure out the answer for you, there was really no way to do that. You could search and you could read it yourself, but suddenly this like giant corpus of unstructured text that everyone has like gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of this is suddenly has gone from like this pile that's eating up disk space to like maybe something that's really valuable to you. So like at that point, we tested some stuff. It worked well and we pivoted hard. And like the last year and a half, we have been focused on AI. The AI email assistant has been my favorite feature by far. And, you know, just to kind of describe it and you can, you know, give me a little, refine my description, but it basically exists as a side panel on the, and, and as kind of like a popover on the mobile app, which you also have, although I've spent more time so far with the desktop version, uh, but I can kind of bring up a side panel that's alongside my main inbox. And then I can basically just have a chat GPT like experience with that assistant, you know, in, in a chat back and forth, natural language sort of way. But with the difference that obviously it is connected into all of my emails. So it can do searches against that email. It can pull up relevant examples. And then it can also, it can also connect to my calendar and then it can even start to draft responses for me. Feel free to kind of elaborate on how you would typically pitch the or describe the the product experience. And then I really want to get into, you know, the weeds of how do we set up the agent architecture? You know, what is the you know, obviously being a database guru, like what is the RAG implementation look like? And, you know, how are you actually bringing about such good results in the right as me department? Those are kind of the three big areas. But for starters, you know, you can refine my description. I think the thing that really impress us about LLMs is how general purpose they are. Like you can go into chat GPT and you can talk about just about anything. Like last night I made fried chicken sandwiches and like I got it to explain to me how to make a fried chicken sandwich. And today I'm like asking it coding questions. And they could do all this stuff, which is really cool. And so one of the struggles we had early on when we were trying to figure out how to bring this stuff into, into short wave and, and provide value is like, okay, if you can do anything, like where'd we start? And we thought, you know, the, the first thing we should probably do is build something super general purpose that gives somebody the full breadth of what is possible, even if the UX isn't super polished for any particular use case. So we can get a better understanding of what people want to do. So the concept for us was similar to so sort of chat GPT of like, what if there was like a human sitting next to you in a chair, watching you do your email, who knew everything about what's on your screen, who knew everything about all the emails you've ever sent, received, who knew about your calendar and could help you do stuff. And one of the reasons we had confidence it, that this would be a, a good idea is this is something that people already have. Like people have executive assistants that sit in their inbox and help them with their calendar and schedule things. And people pay a lot of money for this. And we thought, hey, if we can build something that does some small fraction of that reasonably well, this could be really valuable to people. And so we started with something very conversational, very general purpose. You could do it, it you know, you could do all the normal stuff you do with, in ChatGPT with it, but you can also ask about your calendar, ask about your emails, have it do searches for you, have it write things for you, all of that kind of right, right from that sidebar. And we do intend over time to have like much more focused experiences for certain things. So I don't know if you play with the AI autocomplete feature, but that's one where we're like trying to optimize the UX, but we wanted to start general, figure out where the, the really common use cases were, and then polish those experiences as we learn. For starters, when I first sign up, I connect my Gmail. And there's, is there support for any other client or is it's hundred percent, you have to have a Gmail to, to start with it? Or could I start with a, I guess nobody's really starting from scratch really much. Right. But 
could I just come and start a shortwave account with no other email client at all? Not yet. It's it's Gmail only. We would love to have, you know, a hosted service that just, you know, we set up an account for you. We'd love to have it eventually be something that works for the Microsoft suite and something that's on-prem that's all in the ambitions. But one of the things that just helped us move faster is the go-to-market of, I have an existing account, I sign in with my Google account and boom, I have all of my email there and I have all of my labels and contacts and everything like that. Onboard experience is really nice. And so that's really where we're focusing our RV1 here. Gotcha. Cool. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash cognitive. That's oracle.com slash cognitive. oracle.com slash cognitive. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount. So one of the first things that you do is import the email history. And, you know, as you mentioned, there's gigabytes sitting around for most people. Certainly I'm among them. I've given my email address out perhaps too freely over time. And so, you know, there's an unbelievable amount of content in there. Most of it, not very valuable. And one of the big challenges is getting to the valuable stuff, given all that clutter. I'd love to hear, you know, more about that kind of data processing pipeline, because certainly as you're setting this up for later success, the importing of the data and any pre-processing of the data or any em embedding of the data is like a pretty critical aspect of the whole thing. So what, what's happening in that first import phase? So this is actually a place that we got kind of lucky in that, well, I mentioned when we first started the company, we were trying to build a collaborative email app. And if you want to make something collaborative, you, that means you want to like share data with other people. You probably want things to update in real time. And so the architecture you want to build for an app like that is something where there's, you know, both client and server working together and there's real time streams of data moving back and forth. And this was a, an architecture that we were very comfortable building because this is how the Firebase products work. That's how we built it. And when we decided to, to focus on LLMs and, and integrating those, this turned out to be a really big win because unlike basically all of our competitors, we have all of your emails on the server. So we, we did the heavy lifting of we're going to import them when you when you sign up, which is you know very expensive for us to do because we have to have copies of all that stuff and we have to re-index and everything. But we have that data now, which means things like embedding and storing the vector database or having like access to a beefy cluster of GPUs to like run across encoding models is something that's really easy for us to do relative to other people that might have to start from scratch when doing that. So the moment you sign up, we start, you know, reverse chronologically going through and sucking your emails. And you can actually see that pop into your inbox as we're moving along. And we're taking those and we are, you know, saving off a copy of them uh, in in our in our database. And then we are indexing those both in Elastic so that we can do full text search, but then also we are embedding them with an open source model and throwing them into Pinecone, which is our vector database for retrieval there. And that whole process can take, depending on the size of your inbox, you know, from you know, a few minutes to a few days, it's not uncommon for someone to have, you know, three, four, five million emails in their inbox. So it's a, it's a big process. But once we have all that stuff indexed, uh, we can do a bunch of cool stuff. We can do full text searches against it. We can do AI based searches against it. So it, it's really powerful. Can you uh, comment a little bit on the choice of embedding model and also the choice of vector database? Pinecone, I don't know if they offer both a self hosted version and a hosted version. But yeah, I'd love to, I mean, we have a lot of folks, obviously the whole world is implementing RAG stuff right now. So 
everybody wants to learn from your hard won lessons in terms of the right models, the right infrastructure to use. We actually, at this point, I think have decided that even even though we just released this in October, it's all obsolete, and we're gonna we're gonna do a bunch of new stuff. But we chose to use a, an open source embedding model. It was just it's called Instructor XL. It was on it was on Hugging Face as our as a embedding model because it is cheap and fast and works well, and the vector is not too big. And we you know we we kind of did the math on hey you've got millions of emails and you know what is this gonna cost? And with the way we wanted the infrastructure set up, the Vector database was going to start to dominate in terms of cost. And so we didn't necessarily want the biggest, best model because we store you know, a ton of emails. We don't necessarily query them super often. And there's trade offs that you can make between the effort you spend embedding, the size of the embedding, the effort you spend doing the searches. So, for example, with a with a smaller vector for your embedding model, you might not be as precise in your vector search. But what you can do is you can simply like return more results and shove more results into the prompt. So maybe the queries are a bit more expensive, but the embedding and the storage is cheaper. So you want to you want to factor that all in. So yeah, we chose a an open source embedding model that made the embedding cheap. We chose a sort of medium sized vector to make the storage relatively cheap. We've chose Pinecone primarily for performance considerations. So it has a feature that none of the other kind of top tier vector databases has, which is namespacing, where we can, without a performance penalty, have a huge number of users on the, you know, on there together, and it makes it easy to manage that. Like we looked at, you know, using PG Vector and, and a bunch of these other things, and a Pinecone gave us the the best option there. And now, how would that contrast? Because PG Vector, I think, is obviously one that my guess is going to increasingly become a lot of people's first contact with vector databases, just because they've already got the PG part of PG Vector, and so yeah, why not, right? How does that fall short? I'm imagining if I want, wanted to run a query, you can always do the like where user equals their ID and vector, but it, why why does that not work as well? It comes down to the implementation. So in, in PG Vector, when you do a query like that, where you say, you know, find me things that are semantically similar to blah, and then filter in these with these criteria, it's doing those in order. It's first going out and it's doing, you know, okay, nearest neighbors, finding those and then it's filtering by that other criteria and if you have all of the different vectors from all of your different users jumbled together in the same table you're going to have to sift through like a very large number of those vectors and that can just slow things down and there there are workarounds here so for example like you could just make a lot of tables which is something that i've, I've talked to people who do this but that comes with a lot of sort of headaches in terms of database management that we didn't necessarily want to take on so I think if you're if you're in the process right now of picking your vector database, you should think how many namespaces do I need? Am I is it one per user? Is it one per company? Is it one global one? You should think hard about how many documents you have and how big those documents are. And I think for most people doing RAG, they're not working with as many as we are, right? Like for us, we, an email inbox could have millions of emails. I think a lot of the use case people have for RAG, it's maybe you know thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So. The, the right choice for you might be different. We did look at PG Vector because we we also have the PG part of that in our stack, and it would have been very convenient. But I, I think we made the right call in, in what we did here. In terms of the size of the, and this maybe is one of the, the things that perhaps you're already thinking about evolving, but I know that OpenAI just released an update to their embedding product. And I haven't studied this in detail yet, but I understand that basically they have come up with a way to have variable length vectors and sort of do it such that if you use the small one, you're getting like the bulk of the information. They've kind of like, you know, created varying sizes that, you know, go sort of apply like an 80-20 sort of principle where they're capturing most of the information in the smallest version and then you get incrementally more, but it obviously, you know, grows in size to capture that greater resolution. Do I have that right? And is that the kind of thing that you are thinking of moving to next? That's my understanding. I think it's I think it's super smart because the you know you don't like I said you don't necessarily want the biggest vector. You want to figure consider the trade offs between you know how many documents you have, how often you query these documents, how good you need those results to be, how fast you need those results to be, and there's a lot of different options for making this stuff work. So if I can give it to our architecture briefly for RAG, it's not just quite so simple as you know. You ask a question and we and we go to the vector database. When we when we do our AI search, we're actually searching across our traditional search infrastructure using keywords and labels and time ranges. We sort of extract features and, and we do that. 
And then we're also looking at the vector database and we're taking all of those results and we're running them through another model for re-ranking. So we have a cross encoding model that basically looks at the question you're asking in every document and says, how likely is this document to help answer the question? And because we have that cross encoding model, we don't need the vector database to be super accurate because what we can do is just overfetch. We can, we can just cast a really wide net and say, give me a lot of nearest neighbors and then run those to the cross encoding model to, to actually like winnow that down to a smaller set. So in our case, we said, hey, you know, the trade-off there is basically performance, right? The more of these that we have to, to sift through with the cross-encoding model, the slower it'll be. Um, and so we want to trade off basically latency at retrieval time against cost for storage and cost for embedding. And we tried to pick like a peak that made sense for us in, in that regard. But I think that peak is going to be different for different applications. So the, the idea that you're going to have that flexibility with embedding models going forward, I think is really key, really smart. One thing actually I want to, I want to add here in, in the vector database world, I think one of the changes that's going to come up here is people are going to start separating compute and storage so that it be right now, you know, most of the offerings that you have, that stuff's very tied together. And if you have something that has, you know, a lot of storage and a little bit of computer needs a lot of compute and a little bit of storage, you might not have a very good cross trade off, but uh, Pinecone just came out with a hosted service that we're, that we're looking at. And I think other people looking at this as well of like, how do we make smarter cost trade offs for people who's, you know, storage and reading and writing patterns might be different than other people. Interesting. So down to the user level optimization of how you would manage their, is it managing their database or managing how you're accessing the database? I guess it could, it could be both, right? But yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Maybe we'll bump up one layer to the agent, to the AI assistant layer, and then we can still take a couple additional deep dives into the rag side of it. So, you know, folks who listen to the Cognitive Revolution will certainly be familiar with the kind of basic scaffolding of an agent, you know, put a language model in a loop, give it a chance to kind of plan, give it a chance to, you know, think step by step, give it a chance to take some action, get some feedback. And okay, so we, we know that you have essentially a version of that where when I type in a request to the AI assistant, and these can be like, find me something out of my email or find and draft or you know, even like find and check against my calendar for availability and draft um, and you could suggest some more use cases there perhaps as well but those are the, the kind of main go-to ones that i've been that i've been using yeah i was gonna say the biggest ones are, are really search and things related to search like find this information for me and synthesize it this way and then writing you know help me write an email which often also uses search to to get the right context yeah i think it's cool on the on the search i mean there are so many times where i'm like where did I have that? You know, I, I want a link. I put a, I know I put a link in an exchange with someone, but you know, I might have multiple threads with that person. I, you know, I'm not exactly sure what my, you know, highlight what, what the like link text was when I put that in there. I have one of the great use cases is so simple, but it's just like so refreshing is to just ask, can you find me the link to the whatever that I sent to whoever and just have it pop back with that and be like, yep, that's the link. Amazing. Now I'm not like manually, you know, loading up all these screens and scanning through all the threads on my own. I find that in and of itself to be, you know, just a, an extremely great use case. I mean, maybe I have memory problems that other people don't suffer from, but uh, for me, that's been really cool. And I like the writing as well. And I, I do want to get into more detail on kind of exactly how that works. But so I put in a, a query. It goes through this kind of pretty you know, familiar, at least from a UI, like presentation layer agent sort of loop, it'll say it's thinking, it'll say it's searching, it will potentially say it's, you know, going to cross reference against the calendar, and then it can be drafting as well. You want to kind of unpack those steps a little bit, like, for example, when searching, you know, notably, like, I didn't give it keywords. So I imagine there's a, a translation step in the background. And again, I think people really are are very eager to learn from your hard won lessons. So no, no detail would be too much detail here. The thing that people are most impressed about with, with our AI assistant is frankly, that just, it just works at all. I think, you know, there's lots of people that are, you know, building demo AI agent systems, but there aren't very many that have actually plugged it all the way end to end together in like a real working product and made it valuable. And ours, I wouldn't say there's nothing that we're doing that I think is like, revolutionary graphic like we're not you know ai researchers we're you know we're software people we're application developer people but we have 
manage to duct tape together all the right components and hook it up with traditional infrastructure in a way that actually delivers a working product. And I think the one of the core insights that we had early on when building this was that we couldn't get planning to work for the quality of models that we were working at the time. And I still think that's probably still true, where if you try to break it down into a series of steps where each step sort of feeds into the next step and each step does some piece of work, that there's going to be errors made by the models at each step that propagate through. And we weren't just weren't able to get the quality level where we want to be. So we changed it a little bit and we said, okay, what if the goal here was to end up with one prompt that had all of the information you need in context, right? There was never anything left out of that final prompt. Like you're trying to get one prompt that has all the right information and you answer the question in a single LLM call. And then all of the other interesting stuff you do is try to get really clever about how you figure out what things to put in that prompt. So that's the way to think about our architecture is we do a whole bunch of work to try to figure out what should go in the prompt. And then we make one call to GPT-4 at the end being like, here's everything you need to know. Give us the right answer. The work to figure out what goes to that prompt actually tends to look a lot more like the agent architecture that you that you might be thinking of. The first thing we do is we try to, we do this thing called tool selection, where we try to figure out what information is the user suggesting that we go get. Um, and we just do this with a prompt with an LLM call. But in that LLM call, we are including a lot of context about the world. So we're telling it, hey, this is the user you're helping. This is the time of day. This is the settings that they have. This is this, the thread that's currently on screen. Like this is like the subject in the first few paragraphs of it. This is the stuff that's selected in the inbox. Like we tell the LLM, this is the state. And the reason for that is you might be asking contextual questions that, you know, by themselves are not answerable, but in context makes sense. You might be like, you know, if, you know, the thread might be like the Super Bowl and you might be like, what time is the game? And we can figure out if we plug all this stuff together, you're talking about the Super Bowl, but just in the abstract, we can't. So the first thing we do is we we do this thing called tool selection using this big prop that has all the state of the world trying to figure out what you're asking. And that returns essentially an array of different data sources. And those data sources could be as simple as including the full text in the thread that's on screen. It could be including settings that you have um, it could be including certain like extra custom prompt instructions. Like we have a special set of instructions whenever you're trying to get us to summarize things so that we give you good summaries. But it could also be pulling up historical emails. And that's probably where, where the most interesting stuff is, is like ac- accessing your historical emails. And if we choose that tool, so you'll notice like sometimes when you ask questions, it gives you an answer pretty quickly. And sometimes when you ask questions, it like says searching and then it's a little bit slower. That's basically, those are the times when we decide, okay, they want us to do RAG. We're going to do RAG and, and, and pull that in. So if we've chosen to do RAG, which is like one of like six or seven tools that we have, the next step is what we call query reformulation. So we want to take the question that you've asked, which may reference contextual information. It may reference previous messages that you sent. Like you might, it may not make sense by itself unless you've like read the history. And we try to restructure that into a single standalone question. And we use this, we use an LLM called the biggest. We say, take you know, take all of this information that's contextual, take the whole history of the threat, the thread, and give us one question that has all the information needed to actually answer the question. And so, for example, it'll it'll turn, you know, pronouns into people's names. It'll turn, like, relative times into absolute times and things like that. Then we take that reformulated query and we do what we call feature extraction, where we try to look for what are some searches that we could run on our traditional infrastructure that might return relevant results. So, for example, if you mention a label, you're like, you know, find this thread. I think it was labeled with, you know, Nathan. We'll be like, ah, Nathan labels. We'll do a search for that. If you reference a time range, we'll try to pull up things from from that time range. We'll look for certain contacts. We'll look look for certain keywords. Um, so there's a bunch of these different things that we do. And the feature extraction is actually done with a model as well, a smaller, smaller faster model, but a model as well. We pull out a bunch of these features and we run a bunch of additional searches. Then we take that reformulated query and we embed it. And in parallel with running all these searches against Elastic with these traditional uh, queries, we're also doing that a KNN a search in Pinecone and pulling those results back. And we end up with a big pile of threads, right? Some of them are semantically similar to the question. Some of them match the metadata that you've referred to. Some of them match the keywords that you've talked about. And we put those together in a big pile. We take that set of threads and we, we have a heuristic that we apply on top of those that's just based on like experience. Like we tried a bunch of stuff and we saw what worked and what didn't. And as an example, we do recency bias where we say, hey, if someone's asking about like when is my flight, 
they're probably talking about a flight that's been discussed recently. We just figured out, hey, there's a we're going to have like a function that we apply that older things get marked down a little bit. And so from that big pile of threads, we then winnow it down to a somewhat smaller pile of threads. We take that pile of threads and we send it into a crossing coder. So we have a model that we run on our, on our MGPs. It's an open source model that takes for a given question, does this document help and the how much does it help? And we get a score out of that. And we go through the whole set of emails that we pulled into memory and we get a score. We take the output of that. We do another pass of heuristics. We end up with a score. We sort that. And then we take the top like 50 or so. We send those back to the client. So after all of this from all of these different sources and all this re-ranking and stuff, we finally say, okay, here are the N emails, usually like 30 to 50 N emails that we think are most relevant to answering this question. We send those back to the client. The client takes those and it makes its call to OpenAI and says, you know, basically, here's the question that they're answering. Here's the data from all the tools, right? Remember, remember that RAG is just one of the many tools that we can use. Here's the data from all the tools. Try to answer the question. And that prompt also includes a bunch, a bunch of custom instructions about how to format the output. So you'll notice that our AI assistant, it like linkifies threads for you. It does rich text. If it's writing an email, it'll actually look like an email, have buttons and click and stuff on it. So that is basically done through prompt instructions to GPT-4 that force it to output stuff that we can then parse and like turn into UI for you. So we get that response back. We do that parsing and post-processing and linkification and stuff. And then we spit out the output to you and you get a thing that, that looks like our AI system. Cool. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. The tech world turns to the Brave browser for its unbeatable privacy protections. But did you know that Brave also has a private ad platform? Brave Ads offers first-party targeting, and it's been cookie-less since day one, so you can relax while third-party tracking cookies disappear from the web. Today, millions of people turn to ad blockers to avoid being tracked and pestered online. But Brave's new ad model aligns incentives for users and advertisers. Users earn rewards for viewing ads, which they can save, spend, or pass along to their favorite creators. And advertisers score points for respecting user privacy, generating ROI without invasive tracking. So whether it's high-impact announcements on the new tab page or keyword-targeted ads in Brave Search, Brave offers diverse, private, future-proof ad formats for all your business goals. Join the future of advertising at brave.com slash ads. Mention MOZ when signing up for a 25% discount on your first campaign. Today's podcast is brought to you by Plum. You've probably noticed by now that the AI features in your favorite products kind of suck. They're cool the first time, but pretty soon you're underwhelmed. That's because truly great AI features require complex pipelines and rigorous testing that most startups simply don't have the time or tooling to get right. That's why Plum created a collaborative AI app builder that's purpose-built for product teams. Your users deserve better than a glorified GPT wrapper. Blow their minds with Plum. Check out useplum.com. That's Plum with a B for early access. Hey all, Eric Torenberg here. I'm hearing more and more that founders want to get profitable and do more with less, especially with engineering. Listen, I love your 30-year-old ex-fang senior software engineer as much as the next guy, but honestly, I can't afford them anymore. Founders everywhere are trying to turn to global talent, but boy, is it a hassle to do at scale, from sourcing to interviewing to on-the-ground operations and management. That's why I teamed up with Sean Lanahan, who's been building engineering teams in Vietnam at a very high level for over five years to help you access global engineering without the headache. Squad, Sean's new company, takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent so you don't have to. With teams across Asia and South America, we can cover you no matter which time zone you operate in. Their engineers follow your process and use your tools. They work with React, Next.js, or your favorite front-end frameworks. And on the back end, they're experts at Node, Python, Java, and anything under the sun. Full disclosure, it's going to cost more than the random person you found on Upwork that's doing two hours of work per week but billing you for 40. But you'll get premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost. Our engineers are vetted top 1% talent and actually working hard for you every day. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Head to choose squad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. There's a lot there. So I counted, I think, four language model calls in the whole loop, but the first three are open source models. So the first one was figuring out what tools to use. The second one was changing the query to kind of 
flesh it out with all the proper names and all that kind of stuff. The third one was the relevance between the question and the returned thread. And then the final one is the one that actually goes the heavy lifting, although that all was pretty heavy just to get there. The final one is the open AI one to actually do the final reasoning and drafting. You, you actually missed a, a class of them, which is the feature extraction. So after we rewrite the, the query, we then use a bunch of models to pull out specific features. That's where we look for labels and keywords. And each of those is a different call. We do the tool selection, we rewrite the query, we pull out the features, we do the cross encoding, and then we do the answer at the end. So there's serially five calls and the feature extract is actually like five different things in parallel. So there's every time you ask your question to that assistant, we're doing like 10 LLM calls. And I want to note that before we did that, we embedded all your emails, right? So there was a whole bunch of your process like done beforehand, your millions, honestly, to like set up the data to do that. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of LLMs going on. Any time you do anything. There's a lot of good tidbits there for sure. And, and maybe some important lessons, just high level as well around how, you know, you really do have to engineer a system in today's world, you know, and that's why this is like hard, right? It's not just the kind of thing that you can throw straight at GPT-4, even if that is the kind of, you know, final step and the one that, that makes the whole thing kind of possible in the end, like the amount of work that goes into that is, is pretty intense. All these different models, you mentioned Hug and Face, are you fine tuning those models? Are you hosting those models yourselves or are you able to just use open source and potentially, you know, commercial infrastructure. So we have, at this point, we have six models that we're running in production. We use three from OpenAI. So we use GPT-4, GPT-3.5, and a fine-tuned version of GPT-3.5. And I'll, I'll talk about how we use that in a little bit. And then on our own infrastructure, we use Instructor Excel, which is an embedding model. We use a cross-encoding model that's been trained on some data that Microsoft open sourced a while back. Um, and we use Mistral. And the GPT-4, GPT-3.5, the cross-encoding model, and Instructor are all used for RAG. It's all the stuff I just talked about. The other two models are used for, for other features. So the Mistral we use for our summaries. We may end up using Mistral for more things because I, I've been, we've been quite impressed. Uh, and it's something that we can run on our infrastructure, which is a lot of benefits. So I think we'll be using that for more. For more. But right now, that's used for our instant summaries features. And the fine-tuned GPT-3.5, we use for our AI algorithm. So... I don't know if you've, you've played with this. Have you, have you played with this feature? A little bit, not as much. I've been so enamored with the assistant that I haven't gone. This is more like a GitHub Copilot type inline experience, but I, I, have, I wouldn't say I've uh, spent as much time with it. The idea here is people liked the writing. They thought the writing was good, but you know, opening up the pane, asking a question was kind of a slow UX. And like, we want to try to just streamline that UX and give you basically the same quality of answers that you get, but without having to do that on the side. And we were using a similar system, but what we discovered was that GPT-4 was too slow to do this. So we needed to use GPT-3.5, but GPT-3.5 couldn't, just wasn't smart enough, especially not smart enough to get the, the nuances of like what completion would be in various different cases right. And so, but we found that you could really effectively fine tune for that use case. So basically what we did is we took some of our own emails. Um, so not, you know, there's no customer data here because it's purely our own emails. And we did the thing where you, you know, take an email, you remove a section, and then you train it on the correct answer being the actual email you sent in the first case. So it's one of the, you, you, the, your data set is emails with sections removed, and then the correct output is the section completed. And we did this in a bunch of cases. And this taught, this, this taught it kind of the, the formatting and, and like generally like how emails should work. And that combined with the RAG approach that I talked about and some prompting was enough to get the the voice right as well. So basically it's a prop where it's like, you know, mimic the user's voice. Here's a whole bunch of examples of that. And then it's get the facts right and a whole bunch of examples of relevant facts for the emails. And then a fine-tuned model to try to get the formatting right. And then we put that all together into that, that autocomplete. And is that the same experience that's dr doing the drafting if it's in the assistant versus if it's in the autocomplete or that's a, that's a different drafting stack? It's a little different. So th th there are a lot of similarities in terms of we pull some of the same emails for context. The prompts are very similar, but the, I think there's two big differences that you get in the assistant, which is why I think you'll find if you do the assistant, you actually, you do get slightly higher quality answers. One is the assistant is using GPT-4 Turbo because 
people who are doing that are willing to wait wait a little bit longer. And so, okay, it's a little, little bit slower, but like we'll use that. So you, you do get the benefit of a, of a more powerful model. The other big difference is in the AI assistant, you can do regular searches as well. So for speed and for UX reasons, when you're doing autocomplete, we're only looking through emails that you have sent in the past. And we're only giving auto completions of like things that you have said, facts that you have shared in the past. But in the AI assistant, you can also say things like, you know, find the order number for my Amazon package from last week and insert that into the email. Because, and because you could be like so explicit and because people are willing to wait longer, we'll do sort of like arbitrary retrieval for you when writing those emails. So you get more capabilities. Gotcha. Interesting. Any tips for fine tuning 3.5? One that I've shared and you might have a kind of twist on it is the importance of training on reasoning. So for Waymark, we have a you know, very different use case, but honestly kind of a, and way less intensive in terms of retrieval, but kind of comparably complicated the setup in that, you know, ultimately we're like putting together a video and that's a multimodal thing. And so there's like, you know, whatever, six different models in production, yada, yada, yada. The fine tune three, five is our script writer. And we found in the early going that we could not get the scripts to really sing for us. It just, we did not, we weren't pleased with the quality and the big step that got us over the hump to where it was like, okay, yeah, this is good to go. And better than what we had previously was including chain of thought reasoning in the training data, which then also of course gets it to do that chain of thought in the, you know, in the actual generation at runtime and by kind of teaching it how we want it to think about the kind of script that it should be writing, we got just like dramatically better results than training it just on the examples themselves. So I wonder if you have any other, you know, kind of do something similar or any other tips for the fine tuning, because that was a huge unlock for us. I'd love another one. I feel like I just learned something really cool. That is, uh, we, we don't include like chain of thought examples of the fine tuning, but that actually would be really cool. I had not considered that. I, I would say for us, we had tried in the past to use fine tuning for stuff, and I, I, I just it never really worked for us before. And I think the issue is you got to get the you got to get the right data set, and with this particular data set where we have basically we can we can take a huge set number of emails that you have sent, like real emails, and do the you know remove a part and then tell it to complete that part and then tell it the right answer is the part that was actually there. That approach has worked really well. So I think if you have a a really good data set to work with. I've been pretty impressed with the results. And I think one of the things that surprised us is, is how well it's generalized. We were a little bit worried that like it would just start writing the same emails that we had written. And that did not happen. It actually generalized super well and continued to respect like the context in RAG, which was a pleasant surprise. So I've been very happy with that. But yeah, that, that chain of thought thing, that's, that's something we should check out. So yeah, I want to make sure I understand your approach too, because there might be something here that I can use also. It sounds like you are first assembling from your own email history a bunch of long threads where it's like fill in this blank in this email and you show it the thing to be filled in or you know with the with the piece missing to be filled in and then okay, here's the the missing piece. So you set up a number of those and then you do that also at runtime for the individual user. You're bringing in kind of synthesizing that on the fly and saying, okay, here are, you know, whatever, 10 examples of this from that user's own history. And now the AI's job is to do the last. And it's learned the task from your data, but now at runtime, it's doing it on the individual user's data. Precisely. The, the prompt that we use here is we're doing retrieval when you do autocomplete as well. When you put your cursor into that, to that input, and if you have AI autocomplete turned on, we're running two queries. The first query is, Find emails that you have sent that are in reply to similar threads. So the, the KNN we're doing is off of the emails above. We're saying, when the user got an email like this before, how do they respond? And we're pulling examples like that. And the prop says, you know, here are some emails that the user has sent previously in response to similar threads. We also look at the drafts that you're writing. So if you say, you know, my address is colon, you don't necessarily, it's clear to us that like, maybe you just want to find places where you talk about your address. So we separately do another query where we say, take the draft they've written, embed that, and find emails that they've sent that are similar to the draft so far. And we pull both of those and we put those into the prompt. And with just stock GPT-3.5, that kind of works, right? You, you can tell it, 
you know, here's some emails that they've sent. Here are some emails that they, you know, are similar to the draft. This is what they've written so far. Or give us the completion. And it kind of works. But the, the problem is it doesn't get kind of the, the the formatting right. It'll, you know, rather than give you a sentence, sometimes it'll give you two paragraphs. Sometimes it'll give you two letters. It will screw up the white space for things. It will not really sound like an email. Like emails sort of have a certain certain style for them. Sometimes it will repeat everything you've said so far and spit out the full email. So it, it doesn't really get the nuances of the like following instructions. And there's a lot of examples that give you like little detailed nuanced things where you're like, oh yeah, I could see why I would, would figure that out. And another thing it actually, here's, here's a funny thing that I had to learn from training. It didn't do a good job of pulling facts from history. So like one of the, one of the examples I like to show people when they come visit is like our Wi-Fi password is colon and like it can autocomplete the, the password. But without fine tuning, it couldn't figure out that even though there was an email above that was like my password is blah, that it should put that into the, to the completion. And so what we do with the fine tuning is we have a script that we run on our own inboxes that like pulls out the emails that we've sent for each one of those assembles a prompt, including all of the RAG information necessary to construct that prompt. So we have a full set of what the real prompt would have been for that user in that case. We understand what the, what the real email that was sent. And then what we're fine tuning on is the real prompt that would have happened in that case with us picking a random sentence that we like remove half of it from. And then the you know, round truth being what the email was that was actually sent in that case. And it teaches it formatting. It teaches it like what an appropriate length would be for a completion. And it also teaches it stuff like, hey, you're supposed to like copy paste facts from above and like put it into the thing below. Most of that's like real emails, but we also insert, we for, for cases where we ran into places where it was like not well behaved, we inserted a contrived examples of here's a case that we would like you to handle this way. We have a bunch of those in the training data set as well. With all of this stuff going on, it is striking to me that the experience is pretty fast. I mean, when I do the chat, of course, there is, you know, a little bit of a wait, but it's not like, you know, just hearing all of the all of this discussion and all of the stuff that's going on under the hood, I would expect that people might think that it's slower than it is. It's pretty responsive. I guess, you know, there's probably a lot that goes into that, including just years of database expertise. Any rules of thumb there, you know, parallelize everything that can be parallelized is, is kind of one of my mantras. What else would you say people need to keep in mind? Parallelize everything you can parallelize for sure. Pipeline everything you can pipeline if you can. So for example, like we start cross encoding stuff the moment it's coming out of the database. We're not waiting until all the results are there. Use faster models when you can, right? So we're using GP35 and fine tune GP35 and Mistral and you know when when we when we can because those are faster. Use BC hardware. So like for the for the the summaries that we're generating, like those have to be really fast. So we have uh, rather expensive GPUs that are doing that part. Keep the output short. Here's one of the things we struggle with. You mentioned a chain of thought. Like chain of thought helps in our cases too. We only use it in some sparing cases because it takes a performance hit because you have to wait if because the chain of thought goes above the answer if you actually want it to have the impact, but you have to wait for it to come out. So in any case, we're like performance is really important. We don't want to wait for the chain of thought to spit out before the actual answer fits out. And so what we found is, you know, it's usually for us worth it for us to take the reasoning hit versus take the performance hit. And so in most cases, we're not doing chain of thought. And Tropic recently put out this paper on sleeper agents, and they did a really interesting thing where, you know, the, the goal of this research was to kind of test whether certain safety techniques that are routinely applied, like your RLHF and so on, are enough to protect us from models that may have been like poisoned or backdoored. So you go on to Hugging Face, right, or the open web, you download a model. To date, we really haven't seen much of this, but certainly in the future, you could imagine, well, you know, where did that model come from? I, I sometimes joke, like, do, don't put your mouth on a, on a language model, you don't know where it came from. And, you know, that, again, hasn't been too much of a problem yet, but you can imagine all sorts of, of ways that people might poison the behavior of a language model if they want to, you know, steal your information or cause havoc in any number of ways. So Anthropic created a version of this in-house for the purpose of studying it. And then they look to see, okay, we trained this model to be problematic in a particular way. It was like, in you know, as long as the date is 2023, you write like normal harmless code. But when, in, when the date becomes 2024, then you write like malicious code. And then they go and try, well, what happens if we like RLHF or, you know, apply our constitutional AI techniques 
does that clean that up or does that problem persist through these like standard protocol safety techniques? Anyway, what they find is that unfortunately the problem persists, like just applying your RLHF. If you don't know what the attack is, then like a standard RLHF is not going to be enough to eliminate that behavior. So subject of future work is, well, how will, how will we, you know, potentially figure out how to eliminate that behavior? But anyway, the, the purpose of, of all this was they had three versions of the model that they studied. One was one that just spits out the answer and they trained it, you know, to, to do the problematic thing when it sees a certain trigger. Another one was one that they had the chain of thought training built into it. And then there was the third one in between where they initially trained it with the chain of thought, but then they did additional training to remove the chain of thought behavior. And so it was something kind of in between that has this like chain of thought learning, but doesn't actually do the chain of thought at runtime. And they were interested in that for kind of like obfuscation reasons, right? Like if you're doing a deceptive model, of course, you're not going to do the chain of thought version that would you know, tell your, you know, user, like now it's 2024. So now I'm going into malicious code mode. And that's literally what the chain, you know, the chain of thought one does. So they wanted to kind of teach that logic and try to instill that logic, but then not have it emit that explanation. And the results of that work, I think are super interesting, but it does make me think that possibly you could get better reasoning by fine tuning on chain of thought, and then maybe subsequent fine tuning to not actually have to do that anymore and possibly get, you know, a little bit farther out on the, on the Pareto frontier of, of possibility without having to wait, you know, for all those tokens to be generated. Anyway, sorry for the long digression, but this is what we do here is go, you know, go hard on these questions. Totally. No, that sounds, that sounds very cool. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out after this. Part of the reason I think this could work for, for the purposes that you have is doing the chain of thought made the RLHF even less effective at reversing the problem. So it was like, you know, the behavior is more deeply ingrained in the model and, and like less, you know, quick to be removed. But if you could, you know, apply that to a positive use case, then obviously you might have something, might have something good on your hands. Anything more in the, in the stack and in the, how it's working that you think would be interesting to people? We put out that blog post in October, like this, how this thing works. And at the time, you know, this was cutting edge and we thought it was cutting edge and we actually at this point are like that whole thing is obsolete everything we did that's old school we got it we, we got to redo it and basically every part of that stack we are now looking at how we replace it with something new the overall framework that we're using is working pretty well but i think each part like every single part of the thing we talked about there is a better a better approach so i mentioned with like tool selection when we when we initially did the tool selection we struggled to make fine tuning work the way we want. And so it's GPT-4 Turbo with some smart prompting. And uh, I think now maybe with what we've learned and potentially with, with Mistral, it is now reasonable for us to do the tool selection that way, which has both cost, but also performance benefits. We can do a, a, a Mistral call much, much faster than a GPT-4 call. So on the tool selection side, I think we have a faster, better way to do this with some fine tuning with another model. Same thing for the rewriting of the query and the feature extraction. And like one of the things we're looking at there is like, maybe that shouldn't be two steps. Maybe this should all happen at the same time. Maybe there should be one bigger, smarter prop that like takes all of the context, pulls out that information. On the, the search side, we've seen a lot of Im much better embedding models. Like the embedding models are getting better very quickly. The the one we're using, you know, we pulled out for buggy phase like a, almost a year ago. You know, and there's a lot of other ones we're looking at now. On the vector database side, they're starting to separate compute storage which gives us a nice cost benefits of, you know, we have a lot of storage and a lot of little documents and we don't do a lot of searches. And so it may be practical for us to use an embedding model with a bigger vector and switch to like the pine kernel hostess solution and still get a cost effective method and, st and get better results for the, the cross encoder that, that we have. I think there are better re-ranking approaches. And this is one where I, I don't know that I have much to say right now because we're still like very much in the middle of trying to figure this out. But, you know, there are better cross encoders. There are better techniques in general. So we're going to look at other approaches to re-ranking that, that we can have. And there's also just a lot of sort of traditional infrastructure optimizations that we can make across the stack to like improve performance and do filtering in various ways. So 
yeah, we're going to be ripping the whole thing apart, reassembling. And hopefully, you know, today, I think you probably found the AI assistant, like sometimes it gives you a magically correct answer with the right link. And sometimes it doesn't, it gives you, you know, not the right answer. It tells you it doesn't have an email that it does. And the goal is to make it so you can actually rely on it. Like, you know, you ask the question, it gives you the right answer and you can trust it to do that every time. Uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, certainly none of these systems are fully reliable, but I will say, again, I have been really impressed by how consistent it is and just how kind of solid it feels. I also really appreciate how you surface, This is a, it's a very nice UI and it gives me kind of visibility into, you know, when something is happening. I've got a couple of little minor suggestions for you. One is today, the threads that are retrieved and the threads that are used are kind of shown at the end of a generation. Sometimes I'm like, I actually would like to see that even before the whole process is is done. But in any event, I really do like the UI where it says like, okay, this was based on six email threads or whatever. And then I can click into that. It opens up not just the ones that were used, but also there's like a line above which are the ones that are used and below which are the other ones that were returned, but not actually used in the generation. So I think that's pretty cool. And I also love how then it allows me to just re-rank them myself, myself manually if I want to and, you know, kind of fire it again. I think that is really cool. And my only suggestion on that particular thing would be maybe even just bringing that up sooner as opposed to waiting for all of the process. I don't know if there might be some like gating thing that would prevent that. But another thing, as long as I'm given a couple uh, simple tips, I would love a verbal, like a first class, just audio into it. Even if I'm sitting at my computer, I do feel like I form the thought really quick. I could spit it out really quick. It takes me like another five seconds to type it. And, and then I'm happy to wait. If I could bypass the keyboard and just literally speak to it, I think that would be at least something I would be very interested in using. I don't need it to talk back, I don't think. Maybe occasionally, but yeah, mostly I'm at my computer or I'm, you know, or perhaps I'm on my phone, but yeah, I think I just want to talk to it. Just the just the pure convenience of data from, you know, what's the fastest path? Eventually I'll put a, you know, device on my head and just think like, "Hey, do this email assistant." Uh, but until then, you know, then speaking to it would probably be the fastest versus typing. Although, you know, these things are getting remarkably good as well. It, I'm sure you've seen some of this stuff, but the ability to with fairly intensive hardware reconstruct what somebody is seeing or reconstruct the text that they are thinking about purely from measuring the brain is and when I say intensive hardware, we're talking like fMRI. It's like not the kind of thing you can wear around, but it's also not necessarily something that is invasive in the sense that it doesn't like require surgery or, you know, implantation or anything. That stuff is where I have a whole fascination with that. That's another topic. But yeah, voice would be, you know, a nice intermediate upgrade that wouldn't require any anything too, too crazy. I think we'll probably do voice pretty soon. Up until two weeks ago, we didn't have the mobile assistant. So that's that's a very new thing. We're getting a lot of feedback from customers about this, but I personally have found on mobile, especially most of the time, I want to talk to it because the, the I have two common use cases on mobile. One is I'm looking for something like, you know, where was that restaurant? And I'm in a hurry and I don't have time to type a bunch of stuff. And I'm using AI assistant, so I don't have to like figure out what search to run. And the other use case is I want to send an email but I don't have time, again, to write a nice email. And so I want to use a combination of dictation and an AI that could write like me to like turn my garbled ramblings into something well-written. And both of those are voice. So I, like the, the majority of the AI mobile for me is voice. And I just use the built-in dictation. Your experience is probably similar that like the built-in dictation on the iPhone is not as nice as Whisper. And I would love to, I would love to upgrade our experience there. So We'll we'll probably be doing that, and then a desktop, I you know the same thing, although less less common for me because I got coworkers sitting around. But yeah, I'm in my home office, and you know it's just me, so I can I can be as weird as I want to be behaviorally. You mentioned getting feedback from customers, and I, I one other comment that you made the first time we chatted about all this was that, and people will know where this money is going with all of the detail that you've shared on the imports and the many calls and all that kind of stuff. But as I understand it. Right now, you are losing money on every customer because the subscription, which is a, I forget exactly the price because you were kind enough to give me a, a free account, but it's like, you know, in line with kind of the other things that people are accustomed to paying for as a, you know, retail SaaS subscription, apparently does not cover the cost of delivering on 
all of this processing magic that is going on. So I'd love to hear about kind of the strategy that goes into that. Like, where are you in kind of the business development? Are you trying to get new users or would you tell people, hey, uh, you know, no need to rush into it. We're losing enough money. This is actually, I think, kind of a central part to the strategy. So if you're doing a startup, you want to ride, you know, whatever the, the trend is that's happening. And I think the right time to launch a feature or launch a product is right before it seems possible. So in the case of our AI assistant, I think, you know, no one else had really something like what we do in email. I think a lot of people are like, we're not quite there yet. And that's what you want to get it out. And there's, you know, a few different ways it can be impossible. One is that the technology actually doesn't work. And if you can, you know, be that fast, awesome, right? If you, if you can build just better than anyone, awesome. Another way is like, no one's figured out the product behavior and you're the first one to figure out the product behavior. But another another way is the economics don't make sense yet. And if you have confidence in the trends in the economics, you can afford to make that investment and you can, you know, cover the gap with venture capital. And then over this, over time, it'll make sense. And the best example I have of this is YouTube. So YouTube was losing money like crazy because at the time serving that amount of video infrastructure was really expensive for, for bandwidth and for storage and for you know, re-encoding the videos and stuff. And that obviously worked out real well. And so I think we're at a similar stage where the cost of the stuff that we're relying on is dropping very quickly. And we are right before the part where this is going to look broadly economical and you know, people are going to know how to build these in general and the product experience is going to make sense. And we want to be there, you know, just before everyone else thinks it's a good idea so that by the time everyone thinks it's a good idea, we've got something really solid that works great and has a bunch of customers and is like battle hardened and we can take full advantage of that opportunity. So yeah, we're absolutely open for business. Sign up. We, we got, we got venture backing to make this work and you get the benefit of a, a lot of money being spent to give you a premium experience. Yeah, it's cool. One other thing that you mentioned earlier was the kind of relationship between this product and an assistant. You said, you know, people pay a lot of money for an assistant and, you know, maybe we can create something that delivers at least part of that value. I am working as an AI advisor at a friend's company that is in the executive assistant space. And one thing I would suggest is I think this is a phenomenal tool for an executive assistant. Because so I have an appointed assistant as a you know advisor to the company, and the degree of difficulty though for her to go in to my email, you know, as I said earlier, the account's twenty years old, right? So there's a lot in there. She doesn't know the contacts. She doesn't know you know all these different things. But just to search effectively through my very cluttered inbox is a huge unlock to her. So I think one of the things that I'm kind of interested in doing after this is going and trying to do some sort of pilot or study with the assistants and say like, is this something that could allow the assistant to do a lot better job on the email? I think it may be, I'm mean, interested in your, your thoughts kind of more generally on this, but I'm definitely not one to shy away from the notion that AI substitutes for human labor. I think that's like a, a clear reality and that, you know, denial of that is often kind of a cope. But in this case, at least at this time, I do see a lot of complementarity even between the AI assistant and the human assistant. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I yeah, I don't pretend that our, you know, our little email assistant here is going to do everything that, that a real human assistant could do. And uh, we do we do get a fair amount of requests from folks to do better support for like a delegated inbox for specifically for that use case so that their executive assistant can can use it more easily without like sharing login credentials. I think it could be awesome for the assistant as well. And I think today the people who are using it as their AI assistant are, are not necessarily replacing their human assistant. They're, they're using it in addition to, or they're using it because they can't afford the human. Yeah, I think you also kind of alluded to the idea that the vector database could easily become like the dominant cost driver. Kind of across the entire stack though, I got the sense that, and also just looking at some of the results, you know, as I was using the AI assistant and, and just digging in to see, well, what is it actually retrieving? I got the sense that a massive thinning out of my inbox might be really good for like every aspect of the system. Like it might make your costs go down a lot. It might make things more, you know, could reduce latency perhaps in, in some parts of the process as well. And I honestly would just love to like get rid of a lot of old stuff. 
I'm, I'm paying storage, you know, overage with Gmail. So, you know, for many reasons, I'm like, I wonder if there is a future where as like part of the onboarding, you could help me like just get rid of a ton of stuff. Like 90% could go, I think, from my inbox. Is that something that you're thinking about? I guess the, co the for cost pressure reasons alone, it seems like that that's got to be something that that comes up. I would love to. And I, I would say the the number one feature request that we get is people want the AI to help them more with triage and just managing their inbox. So today we'll have great emails, we'll help you search your emails, but like actually getting rid of the stuff in your inbox. We have we have some features, like you can like multi-select things and you can ask questions about those things and it can help you prioritize and, and stuff like that. But it isn't really doing the, you know, the executive assistant that would come in and be like, we're just going to delete 90% of the stuff. It doesn't get, it doesn't do that for you yet. And the reason is just, we're trying to start with the things that are sort of safer and lower risk and, and ship those and then work into the harder, higher risk things later on. And like an AI that goes and like deletes a bunch of your email, like you really got to have a lot of confidence in it. So we're, we're trying to work our way in that order. But I think there's a ton of opportunity here and there's a ton of demand here. And as an example, with the, the embeddings that we're doing, one of the things that they, that could allow us to do is clustering. So we can say, hey, we're going to look at your inbox. We've embedded all this stuff. We have an vector database. What are the groupings in here? And we go, here, here's, here's a crazy idea. Like, what if you pull up your inbox and we're like, not here's all but the threads. We're like, here's like a typical Tinder style card that you like swipe left and right with like, each of the sort of rough categories of stuff, right? Here's the stuff related to like your podcast next week. And here's all the junk from this marketing website. And, you know, here's all your newsletters. And like those groupings could potentially be custom to you. And we can provide recommendations for what to do with them. So that's that's an idea. But we have a lot of stuff like that we're looking at doing. And I think the embeddings of the vector database with the capabilities it gives you are sort of central to making that stuff work. It's a good reminder that, uh, you know, it's commonly said that, it, that we're still very early in this whole platform shift, but that's another good reminder. And, you know, certainly the interfaces are not yet anywhere close to probably what they will ultimately be in, in mature form. The one thing you'll notice in our UI right now is that the AI can't actually do anything. You can ask it things, it can recommend things, it can give you buttons to press to do things, but the only way to take action is actually for you to click something. And that's very intentional. We want to make it so that you as a user are totally comfortable asking the AI anything, knowing you have full control, like nothing will ever get sent on your, your without your knowledge or control. Nothing will ever get deleted or archived or whatever, unless you click a button. I have noticed that, although I hadn't quite formalized it so crisply. Let's talk about the future a little bit. You know, you mentioned early on that the idea was to create a collaborative email without even knowing that I was thinking, boy, if you could do for Slack what you've done for email, I would be pretty into it. You know, the, just the ability to go fetch context. I mean, in Slack, it's probably even worse. The search is not good. And, you know, it's a real nightmare to try to go collect the threads that I would need to reference to figure out what's going on. And then, you know, of course, drafting things could be extremely helpful there as well. Bit of a different modality in terms of, you know, style of writing. So the, certainly some interesting nuances, but... That's kind of where my, uh, you know, instinct would take you from where you are right now. But what are you thinking about as kind of the future of the of the overall product? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very excited about collaboration stuff in the long term. But I might suggest really what, what I see happening is a reframing of how people think about their inbox. I think up until today, it's been like a pile of to-dos that I have to deal with. And they don't really feel like it's a thing that's adding value to their lives. And... I look at it with LLMs and with the automation we would like to build, if it was like auto triage and stuff, being more of a knowledge base, right? It is it is a corpus of information about like everything that is going on at your business and everything you've ever sent and everyone you've ever talked to and all of your SaaS notifications and all of your meeting invites and everything. And we can now mine that to do useful things for you. So for example, like before we recorded this, it could pop a message up and being like, Hey, you've got this call coming up and here's who this guy is. And, you know, here's some of the discussion that you've had in the past. You could do that sort of thing proactively. So I think it's, it's going to be a reframing from a tool to send and receive messages to a knowledge base that knows all about you that can help you get your job done. I think that extends into your team. Once you say, okay, for me, it's a knowledge base that helps me get my, my job done. What if that is also a knowledge base for other people? So a, a simple example of this would be, you know, you and I 
now have, have interacted. Let's say at some point you start talking to one of my co-founders. It'd be really useful probably for my co-founder to know that you and I have been chatting and have some insight to what we've talked about. And there's obviously lots of privacy things we have to think about there, but wouldn't it be cool if like his AI assistant could talk to my AI assistant and, and get some insights on things that I was comfortable sharing and use that to, to help him with this job. So I see us, you know, going deeper into the, the very normal collaboration things. Like what if you want to like chat with a group at your, your company or you want to share a thread or you want to collaborate on that draft, but also potentially sort of next gen AI things about like, what if your company had a global AI that knew all about everyone's AIs and could help drive the business forward in interesting ways and, and advise people with like the full knowledge of everything that was going on. It's going to be weird, but it's going to be awesome. That's kind of a version, an interesting version of, uh, you know, I don't know to what degree people usually think of it as uh, utopian or dystopian or not even sure, but there's certainly a lot of talk about kind of, oh gosh, you know, now my AI can write my emails for me, you know, amazing. What a great productivity boost. And then, well, geez, you know, I can probably scale up what I'm doing in terms of like outreach by a hundred X or a thousand X, right? I can you know, if I'm recruiting, I can do personalized, high quality outreach to like every profile. Or if I'm doing lead gen or sales, I can, you know, do personalized, high quality outreach to every target. And then it's like, that's, that'll be so much more effective. And I think, you know, there, one of the things that is not well theorized yet at all is just kind of, where does that take us in terms of like a new equilibrium? Because we are, we all tend to think about this, You, I think you're ahead of most based on just your last comments, but you know, so many people are like, I'll do this, then I'll have an advantage. And then they, but they don't n take the next step of thinking, okay, well then what happens when everybody does that? And then what happens when everybody's inbox has got nothing but super high quality, you know, highly personalized outreach. And then you're like, well, geez, now we just have like my mass customization AI talking to your mass filtering AI. And how do we maintain any sanity in a world where our respective AIs are talking to each other at like a frequency and a volume that we individually as humans cannot even keep up with. The probably the most common question like this that I get is, hey, if my AI is writing an email and then their AI is summarizing the email and I write wrote bullet points and they read bullet points, like what's the point, right? Why don't we just send the, the, the thing in, in, the, in between? And my experience, now that I've been doing this a while, like a lot of my emails now, have some AI generated portion to them at this point. And my experience is the better we are at doing our job of like helping you generate their AI emails, the more they are exactly like the emails that you had before, right? If we're doing a great job, the email that you write should be no different whether we help you write it or not. We simply help you do it faster and we help you make fewer mistakes. And I, and I really believe that and I think we can do that. So the hope is not that we're like taking your thing and making it more verbose and then their thing is being trunk and then they read that. The hope is all the emails that you're sending look basically the same. They're just a little more correct and you can just get things done faster. The The question of like, okay, fine, the emails are the same, but there's a lot more high quality emails going around, I think is a very real one and something we're going to have to, to wrestle with. And I think what's going to happen here is, yeah, to some extent, the AI is going to help you triage them and things like that. But I think also the social network is going to start to bear a lot more, right? So like, Personally, I filter partly based on the content of emails, but a big part of my filter is like where I met that person, right? So like in, in your case, like I, I got an introduction to you and you probably read my email because you knew the person that introduced me. I think that sort of thing is going to become even more important of like who, who's connected. I think in the case of a business, like if you have a relationship with the business and you email me, like I should be able to know about that and I should know if this is not spam because there's a relationship. So I see like higher importance for relationships in the social network and less importance on the actual content of the email because that's much more easy to engineer over time. That does seem likely true. I mean, certainly already it's tough to get people's attention if you're emailing them totally cold. It does seem like it might get much harder, even if your outreach is is really good. How how much do you kind of fly at this point? Do you Have you ever had any experience, for example, where you like generated something. We know that the AI can't take that action directly on your behalf, but yeah, looks good. Click send. And then you get a response and you're like, D what did I say? <laughs> I mean, you would be on the cutting edge of that sort of perhaps, you know, falling into over-reliance or, you know, any anti-patterns that you're noticing in your, in yourself. 
that particular case has not actually happened yet. Maybe it will. Maybe I'll get to the point where I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to it that I, I do that. But the the UX that we have for AI writing right now is the assistant pane, which is like a fairly heavyweight interaction because you're like chatting back and forth and you got to click buttons. And so it's not something that like you totally go, your brain goes to like autopilot mode. And the autocomplete that we have today is something that you have to like tab complete, like one sentence fragment at a time. So it takes you a little while to get to the email. So that hasn't come up. We are thinking about what if we write the whole draft for you? And it might get a lot easier to go like full autopilot mode when the whole thing is just sitting there and you can just press send. I do wonder how that'll evolve. And 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 I think we could probably catch some stuff there. We could probably be like, all right, are you sure you read this? You know, you you got the recommendation, you clicked it like one second later, you, we, we could like alert you or I don't know, maybe we do what the Teslas do where they like track your eyes and you're like, oh, you didn't really read this email. I, I am kidding about that. Although the Teslas do do that. You're not kidding about that part. Oh yeah, for sure. One question that I think you are perhaps uniquely well positioned to comment on is like, what's up with Google and their sort of journey on this front? Like there's a million jokes about it takes eight product managers to change the color of a button in Gmail, et cetera, et cetera. They are starting to do integrations of language models into more different products. Now they've, we've also, you know, got Gemini shipped and it is really quite good at least in the, you know, the main Gemini advanced down the fairway product experience. What would you expect from a Google or a Gmail going forward? Like, is it just going to stay this way? Or do you expect, are you kind of in the process of waking up the giant? Like, what's your model of, of where Google is going? It's helpful context that I was at Google for a while. And I actually had some of the ex uh, Google inbox people on my team there. And I, one of the first things I did when we started this company is I talked to a bunch of people who worked on Inbox and got some insight into, you know, why it was, it was shut down and, and what they learned from them. And so I think I have a decent amount of insight into Google and how Google works in, in this regard. And one of the things I got to appreciate when I was there was, and, and I should say, Google's a really well-run company. I generally like really respect Google. They make great products and, you know, it's, it's amazing the, the stuff they can build. But in a company of that size, when you have a product with as much legacy as they do, with as many users as they do, that has many different goals that it's trying to achieve it internally, it is really hard to innovate rapidly in the high, at a high quality. And, and this is for like more organizational and personnel reasons than it is for any any technical reasons. And I, I can give you a little bit of, of, of specifics with Gmail where they have many goals. The, the most important goal for Gmail at Google is actually not to help you get your email done. It's to get you to sign in. Because they want you signed in so that when you do Google searches and stuff, they can associate that with you. Um, they have a secondary goal, which is it's sort of the anchor for Google Workspace. And a lot of things sort of tie in there for all the stuff that they provide in Google Workspace and Google Cloud. And if you look at what they're doing now with AI, it really appears to me, and I think this is the case, that some mandates didn't came down from on high saying, Google as a company is now going hard to AI. We've got these other teams that are building some really great AI stuff. You guys need to add some AI. And I don't know if you've played with the stuff that they've built, but everything they put out so far has been like that. It, ha it hasn't been, you know, some bold, you know, head of product on Gmail being like, we are pivoting this thing and we are going to be this revolutionary new AI thing. It's, it is this organization, a bunch of people being like, we got to meet some OPRs. Let's plug a thing in here. Let's plug a thing in here. Let's plug a thing in here. And without some you know, visionary product leader in Gmail saying, we are going to rethink everything about how this product works. And we are going to make an enormous infrastructure investment. So for example, like if they wanted to like embed all of your emails, put them in a vector database with their like two and a half billion users, that would be a massive expense. So there, there needs to be a visionary leader that really wants to, to, to make changes here. And while those people exist at Google, it's really hard to be that person on a legacy product like this. It's, if you're that person, it's much easier for you to be like, I'm gonna do this for Gemini, or I'm gonna do this for like some new product initiative. And it's a much easier path to, to, for the career progress you wanna make on one of these new things than to go back to Gmail and be like, I'm gonna take this giant super tanker and, and try to turn it. So I think it's gonna be hard for them to quickly bring the sort of organizational leadership that they need to like, turn the ship and do stuff really that's really interesting and so they'll ship incremental things and there'll be other teams at google shipping stuff but i don't think they will themselves I'll, I'll give you an example of this so they have two different products that are attempting to do something similar to the ai search that we do neither of them is close in terms of capability but they have two different ones 
One of them was a feature that they sort of pre-announced as part of Duet AI last summer. And there were some screenshots put out and like I talked to the, the sales folks there and I was like, hey, can we try this? And they said, it's not ready yet, right? It may be next year. So the, one of them is, is kind of vaporware for, for external users. The other, which actually does work and you can use, is the integration they have with Bard, uh, now Gemini, but they had an in integration there. But that integration very clearly was built by the, the Bard team, right? So the Bard team is moving fast and, 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 and they're you know trying new things and they're, they're experimenting with the product. But the Gmail team itself isn't. And so you might end up having like a better, you know, maybe going forward, like your experience search, your emails can be better from Gemini than your Gmail inbox itself because of the way those sort of organization incentives work. Well, I could certainly see a scenario where you might end up back at uh, Google again. I don't know if that's something you would be excited about or open to at all, but it, I have been really impressed with the shortwave experience. I am not an inbox zero person. And honestly, you know, I'm not even sure I aspire to be anymore, but what I want is kind of, you know, what you're on a, certainly on a very good trajectory toward providing, which is just the ability to ask for help and get it and, you know, not have to think too much about it. Even I like thinking about it, you know, as we're here talking about it, but in my daily life, you know, just to, to kind of make it fade into the background and, and just respond effectively to queries and, you know, search effectively. It's been an impressive first couple of weeks on the product, and I'm excited to use it more and also to see where you guys continue to take it as you evolve. That's awesome. Most of what you see is a V1. We move fast. We'll be shipping new stuff. And yeah, the goal is that you don't think about it, right? Like most people who use our product, their job isn't to do email. Their job is to do something else. And we want to get the email out of the way so they can do the thing that, that actually matters for them. Really, really appreciate you having me on. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, this has definitely been a masterclass in RAG and in AI application development more generally. So Andrew Lee, co-founder of Shortwave, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Cheers. It is both energizing and enlightening to hear why people listen and learn what they value about the show. So please don't hesitate to reach out via email or you can DM me on the social media platform of your choice.